Palestinian, co-founder of the BDS movement, and uh, uh, which of course was uh, established in 2005 and um, re regards Israel as an apartheid state and seeks to use uh, peaceful methods of boycott, divestment, sanctions to change uh, the Israeli state and to change the position of Palestinians. Um, Omar was a co-recipient of the Gandhi Peace Award in 2017. And he was educated at Columbia, at Tel Aviv universities, and is currently doing a PhD in political philosophy and political sociology, mainly focusing on ethics at the University of Amsterdam. He's the author of a well-known book about the BDS movement, which is titled BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights, which was published in 2011. So the format of this evening's event is that Omar will speak for 25 minutes or so. Uh, I will then ask some questions and we'll have some discussion. Uh, and then the floor will be open to uh, the listeners, to the audience for an, their opportunity to ask questions of Omar. So Omar, welcome to LSE and uh, we're, very interested to hear what you have to say this evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for having me. I'm glad to be with you, <clears throat> even though it's uh, virtual. Hopefully next time it will be in person. Um, the outpouring of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle following Israel's latest televised massacre in Gaza and atrocities in Jerusalem and across historic Palestine this last summer has been unprecedented, the solidarity. Solidarity from mass social and racial justice movements, including the Movement for Black Lives and the Sunrise Movement, for example, in the US, indicated that silence and both siding the oppressor and the oppressed to shirk the duty to fight oppression have become ethically untenable. Some 340 academic departments and programs and over 23,000 academics globally have expressed solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle in the last couple of months alone, with many of them endorsing BDS or similar accountability measures. The significant shift in discourse on Palestine in most of these solidarity statements reflected in analyzing Israel as a regime of settler colonialism and apartheid is due to the tireless work of Palestinian scholars, academic boycott activists, the patient work of international activists, scholars, and solidarity movements over the years, and without doubt, the racial and social justice uprising led by the Black Lives Matter movement. This unprecedented solidarity reflects an acknowledgement by many scholars that they should never settle for being just academics. They should aspire instead to be just academics, academics who uphold in an ethically consistent manner the principle and value of justice. Cognizant of this, academic associations and student governments at tens of US, Canadian, UK universities have voted in the last few years for various BDS measures, including divestment from companies involved in Israel's occupation, a large student federation a few years ago of 4 million Indian students has adopted BDS as well. Inspired by the South African <clears throat> anti-apartheid struggle and the US civil rights movement, the nonviolent BDS movement was launched in 2005 by the broadest coalition in Palestinian society. It calls for ending Israel's 1967 occupation, upholding the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their lands from which they were ethnically cleansed since the Nakba of 1947 to 1949, and ending Israel's institutionalized, legalized system of racial domination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, as recently acknowledged by Human Rights Watch and Israel's most prominent human rights organization, Salem. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the BDS movement has consistently and 
categorically opposed all forms of racism and discrimination, including anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism, sexism, homo and transphobia, Islamophobia, and certainly anti-Semitism. Identity in the BDS movement should never diminish or restrict one's entitlement to rights. Our movement, therefore, targets complicity, not identity. And that's a key point. <clears throat> a growing number of anti-colonial Jewish-Israeli BDS supporters play a significant role in exposing Israel's regime of oppression and advocating for isolating it. In the US, a recent poll shows that more than one-fifth, more than 22% actually, of liberal Jewish Americans support BDS against Israeli apartheid. Younger Jewish activists there in the US and elsewhere are increasingly abandoning Zionism and supporting Palestinian liberation. They understand that there is nothing Jewish about Israel's siege, ethnic cleansing, massacres, land theft, and apartheid. And therefore, there's nothing anti-Jewish per se in supporting BDS to end these crimes and forms of oppression. They concur with many progressive Jewish groups worldwide that dismantling anti-Semitism must be situated within the broader struggle against all forms of racism and oppression. Israel has, of late, become a role model for far-right, xenophobic, and authoritarian leaders across the world, causing its global popularity to further decline. In contrast, the BDS movement is, is recognized to belong to the intersectional progressive wave fighting the forces of fascism, xenophobia, and savage neoliberalism. This includes Black Lives Matter, the climate justice movement, the decolonial feminist and queer movements, as well as, as, well as other indigenous racial, economic, gender, and social justice struggles. Israel has been waging an all-out war of repression against BDS, including legal repression, for years, partly because of the movement's leading role in popularizing the apartheid analysis of Israel. But perhaps the most important factor is the fact that BDS has drastically redefined solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality as an ethical obligation to end complicity before and above all other forms of solidarity. In the face of flagrant oppression anywhere, apathy and inaction are immoral when one has the ability to act without suffering significantly. They are far more immoral still when one has not only the ability, but also the duty to act because of the complicity of one's state or institution in the system of oppression. Few forms of pressure have triggered as much alarm in Israel's establishment as the growing BDS movement on Western college campuses and the rapidly growing support for a comprehensive academic and cultural boycott of Israel and its complicit institutions. Many may have read the news yesterday and today about the great prodigious uh, author Sally Rooney and how she decided not to have her third book, her third novel, published by an Israeli publisher that is complicit in Israel's system of apartheid because she supports the BDS movement. Uh, she joins a whole, uh, uh, a large number of authors, artists, and many others who are supporting the institutional boycott of Israel in the cultural as well as the academic field. In parallel to this open boycott, many individual academics and artists around the world have joined the widespread silent boycott. It's an unannounced yet quite effective boycott of Israel. So an academic is invited to a conference in, in Tel Aviv instead of jeopardizing her or his career and saying, I support BDS. If, if this is a junior academic, let's say untenured academic, they might suffer if they openly say, we support BDS. 
But instead of saying that, they just cancel. They, they refuse to go to Tel Aviv, saying, uh, you know, they have a scheduling problem, they're sick, whatever the case may be. Israel realizes that an effective academic boycott would irreversibly hurt its brand and feed the growing calls for economic boycotts and eventually targeted sanctions. Israel's academic institutions, after all, have been a pillar of its regime of oppression. They've played a major role in planning, implementing, justifying and whitewashing Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people. The complicity of Israeli universities takes many forms, including the development of weapon systems and military doctrines used in the commission of Israeli war crimes and crimes against humanity. They systematically provide the military intelligence establishment with indispensable research in archaeology, demography, geography, hydrology, psychology, philosophy, among other disciplines. And they tolerate and even reward racist speech, racist theories, and bogus scientific research that dehumanizes the indigenous Palestinians. This complicity, very complex forms of complicity, also uh, uh, include institutionalizing discrimination against Palestinian Arab citizens, among them scholars and students. It includes suppressing Israeli academic research on Zionism and the Nakba, and the construction of campus facilities and dormitories in the occupied Palestinian territory, as Hebrew University has done in occupied East Jerusalem, for instance. Ariel University, located in the illegal Israeli settlement with the same name, was built on stolen Palestinian land. It's a colony college. That's another glaring example of academic complicity. An independent campaign, No Ariel Ties, titled No Ariel Ties, was initiated by authoritative Palestinian bodies and supported by prominent academics worldwide. It calls for non-recognition of Ariel University and for ending all institutional ties with it as a settler university. Examples of academic complicity in Israel's crimes against Palestinians abound. I'll list a few of the most glaring instances, or some of the most glaring instances. Technion prides itself of developing many of the weapon systems, particularly drone technologies, employed by the Israeli occupation forces, especially in the bloodbaths in Gaza. Tel Aviv University has designed tens of weapon systems used by the Israeli military. The Institute for National Security Studies, also affiliated with Tel Aviv University, takes credit for the development of the so-called Dahia Doctrine. Dahia is the southern suburb of Beirut. The Dahia Doctrine, or the Doctrine of Disproportionate Force, that's what they call it, was adopted by the Israeli army and used in Lebanon, as well as in, in, in the occupied Palestinian territory. This doctrine calls for, quote, the destruction of national, i.e. civilian, infrastructure and intense suffering among the civilian population, end of quote, as a means of defeating an otherwise impossible to defeat non-statal resistance. This is made in the Israeli academia, this doctrine. The BDS movement upholds the universal right to academic freedom and therefore calls for boycotting institutions, not individuals. This is an extremely critical distinction that is often lost in your so-called mainstream media. The Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, PACBI, of which I'm a part, subscribes to the UN definition of academic freedom, which prohibits the infringement on the academic freedom of others, as well as discrimination and repression. Anchored in precepts of international law and universal human rights, PACB rejects on principle any McCarthyite type political testing or boycotts targeting individuals based on their opinion or identity, such as citizenship, race, gender, religion, and so on. If, however, an individual is representing the state of Israel or a complicit Israeli institution, such as a university's dean, rector, president, vice chancellor, or this academic is commissioned, recruited, 
to participate in Israel's efforts to rebrand itself, then her or his activities are subject to the institutional boycott that BDS is calling for. The boycott conflicts with academic freedom argument also confuses academic privileges with academic freedom and fails accordingly to grasp that an institutional academic boycott would harm perks and privileges, not rights. Some critics may argue that BDS contravenes academic freedom because it cannot but hurt individual Israeli academics if it is to be effective at all. By ignoring the real systematic Israeli suppression of academic freedom of the colonized indigenous Palestinians and focusing solely on the hypothetical infringement on academic freedom of the colonizers, of the oppressors that the boycott allegedly would entail, this argument is patently racist and colonial. The academic boycott of Israel that Palestinian civil society has called for is closely connected to Israel's relentless and deliberate attack on Palestinian education, which some have termed scholasticide, going back to the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestine, the Nakba. An Israeli researcher's dissertation, for, in, for instance, reveals that during and immediately after the Nakba of 1948, tens of thousands of books, tens of thousands, stolen from Palestinian homes, schools, and private libraries in Jerusalem, Jaffa, Haifa, Safad, and other Palestinian cities were plundered and destroyed, systematically destroyed by Zionist and later Israeli militias. In the first few weeks of the first intifada, the first uprising from 1987 to 1993, Israel shut down all Palestinian universities. Some, like Bir Zayt, was shut down for four consecutive years. And then Israel closed, Israeli military closed all 1,194 Palestinian schools in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza at the time. Next, Israel closed all kindergartens. Eventually, every education institution in the occupied Palestinian territory was forcibly closed. This prompted Palestinians to build an illegal network of underground schools. Palestinian scholars and students are methodically denied their basic rights, including academic freedom, and are often subjected to imprisonment, denial of freedom of movement, even violent attacks on themselves and their institutions, including the bombing of a Palestinian university in Gaza in 2014, and again, in Israel's recent assault on Gaza in May of this year. Palestinian citizens of Israel have also suffered for decades from the structural racism that pervades the Israeli educational system. As far back as 2001, 20 years ago, Human Rights Watch reported, quote, discrimination at every level of the Israeli education system winnows out a progressively larger proportion of Palestinian Arab children as they progress through the school system or channels those who persevere away from the opportunities of higher education. The quote continues, the hurdles Palestinian Arab students face in the Israeli education system from kindergarten to university function like a series of sieves with sequentially finer holes. End of quote. In the past, many academics supported, in the West especially, supported a much more sweeping academic boycott against apartheid South Africa's universities and individual academics. It was a blanket boycott against everyone in South Africa. Yet today, some of the same academics who supported that boycott are reluctant to support a strictly institutional boycott, not an individual boycott, a strictly institutional boycott of Israeli academic institutions that are complicit in the violations of Palestinian rights. This is the definition of hypocrisy. Still, BDS, including the academic boycott, is growing at an inspiring rate. And Israel's standing is nosediving worldwide. 
In a recent YouGov poll, for instance, Israel's favorability dropped sharply since February 2021 among European publics, including in Germany and France. In the UK, Israel's favorability dropped 27 points during that period, making it the least favorable of all the countries surveyed. Another survey shows that 61% of the Labour Party members support BDS, 61%, despite the racist anti-Palestinian positions of the party's current leadership. In the US, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, quote, apartheid states aren't democracies. While Representative Cory Bush went further, uplifting the key Palestinian demand for defunding Israeli apartheid. She said, quote, the fight for black lives and the fight for Palestinian liberation are interconnected. We oppose our money going to fund militarized policing, occupation, and systems of violent oppression and trauma. We are anti-apartheid, period, end of quote. Major TV network personalities, including MSNBC's Ali Belshi and HBO's John Oliver, music icons like John Legend and Snoop Dogg, star athletes in the UK leading football clubs, Hollywood celebrities like Susan Sarandon, Viola Davis, John Cusack, Wentworth Miller, Mark Ruffalo, Natalie Portman, have all expressed solidarity like never before uh, with the Palestinian struggle. Some of them tweeting the famous disappearing map of Palestine under gradual Israeli settler colonialism. Doc workers unions in Oakland, California, Durban, South Africa, and in Italy have refused or started to organize towards refusing the handling of Israeli ships. According to a recently released report by the Euromed Human Rights Monitor, 91% of children in Gaza suffer from a conflict-related trauma after the latest Israeli massacre, which killed more than 67 Palestinian children, injured hundreds and made thousands homeless. UK universities have our children's blood and traumas on their hands. They invest hundreds of millions of pounds in companies that maintain Israel's occupation and apartheid, according to research by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, PSC. Those universities conduct joint research, including military security research, with deeply complicit Israeli universities. Mobilizing pressure to boycott Israel's deeply complicit academic institutions and to end all forms of UK universities' criminal complicity in Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism is the most urgent and ethical obligation of UK academics. Today, more than ever, Palestinians are telling the world that true solidarity with our struggle for freedom, justice, and equality starts with ending complicity, with doing no harm. BDS is therefore the most meaningful international form of solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle. Calling on you, academics, students, staff, to support the academic and cultural boycott of Israel to end complicity, to do no harm, is a call to fulfill a profound moral obligation for the following three reasons. One, as Angela Davis said, justice is indivisible. Two, Israel is not just denying the indigenous Palestinians our basic rights, it's also a threat to peace, justice, and security in many countries. It field tests its security and military technologies and doctrines and spyware like Pegasus on us and then sells them to the world, enabling crimes against humanity in Rwanda, India, Brazil, Myanmar, South Sudan, Colombia, among others, and supporting dictatorships and authoritarian regimes in persecuting, sometimes killing human rights activists, opposition figures, journalists, feminists, queer activists, etc. The third, reason is that in a relatively democratic society like yours, underlying relatively, especially with the current government, the well-documented complicity of your government, your corporations, and your institutions in Israeli apartheid triggers a moral responsibility for you to act 
to stop or at least offset this complicity. To end complicity, we're counting on you to pressure UK universities and cultural institutions to divest from companies that are complicit in grave human rights violations, including Israel's. And to end all institution links with complicit academic and cultural institutions, including in Israel. We're counting on you also to advocate for condemning Israel as not just a settler colonial regime, but also an apartheid regime, and consequently to advocate for imposing lawful sanctions against it, starting with an end to all arms and security trade and research with it. <clears throat> I want, in this context, it's crucial, I think, to remind ourselves that the so-called IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism and the related bullying that we see in the UK today, especially in universities, is designed to silence advocates of Palestinian rights or minimally to push them to a defensive posture, diverting energies and resources away from solidarity and ending complicity in Israel's regime of oppression. When faced with smears and intimidation that are groundless, we must continue to defend our right to freedom of expression and against anti-democratic repression for sure. But most of this indispensable defense is best left to those of us with legal and other expertise that is required to effectively perform this task. For the rest of us, the absolute majority, our main response must be to further grow BDS campaigns everywhere, mainstreaming our demands and expanding our impact on policy at all levels, while being very vigilant against all expressions of anti-Jewish hatred and bigotry. Indeed, despite the IHRA fraudulent definition of anti-Semitism and the related climate of anti-Palestinian McCarthyism that's prevalent in the UK today, the Trades Union Congress of the UK, representing some 6 million members, after effective campaigning by PSC and progressive leaders of the largest trade unions, has called for ending military trade with Israel and for pressuring corporations to end their complicity in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. And despite adopting the IHRA definition, the Labour Party in 2018, in its conference, adopted a freeze of arms sales to Israel as policy and reiterated its support for the Palestinian refugees' right of return. In Labour's most recent conference, the absolute majority went even further, calling for sanctions to dismantle Israeli apartheid. To end, Palestinians are shattering our walls of fear every day. And we need an eruption of courageous, meaningful solidarity that can end all complicity in Israel's regime of oppression. We need you to be not just academics, but truly just academics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar, <coughs> for uh, that very uh, powerful statement. Um, let me begin the discussion. I have a few questions and uh, that will give time for questions to emerge from our listeners and viewers. Um, first question I would ha I have is, <clears throat> you know, you have this tripartite uh, sort of uh, elements in BDS, boycott, divest, sanctions. And I just wonder, I mean, your talk is obviously geared to university audience, so you focus quite a lot on the academic, cultural side of things, what we might call a more, uh, I don't know, soft power side of things. Um, but I just wonder how we might measure the effectiveness of BDS. I mean, do you see some as one of the tangents as being more uh, successful than others? And why do you think that is? You know, is the boycott side, the academic, but the cultural boycott side more successful than divestment or sanctions? I mean, I don't see that much. I mean, of course, the Arab League, I mean, there's a long history of Arab countries imposing economic uh, sanctions on Israel, but that has not extended to you know, Western democracies, Europe, North America, and so on. 
And I don't see any sign there's always a conflict within the EU and discussions about this. Some countries might, might be prepared to go down that route, but they're always blocked by other powerful countries like Germany, for example. Um, so I just wonder, you know, you have this tripartite lever system, but in reality, maybe only some levers are going to, to work effectively. I mean, how do you, how do you respond to that? Um, yeah, thanks for this, Jim. Actually, they're quite connected. Um, I would say organically connected, boycott, divestment, and sanctions in all fields. So let me give, again, the example of the great Irish writer, Sally Rooney. When she announced her boycott, her support for BDS, it's not just the millions of her readers and her fans who were affected and started reading. You know, there are tons of coverage in the media why is Sally Rooney boycotting Israel? Why is she calling Israel an apartheid state? Why does she support BDS? People are learning a lot more about this from this one courageous principled act that she took. And those millions and millions of readers and fans might not go tomorrow to the supermarket and buy Israeli tomatoes from some complicit Israeli company. What is the connection? Well, they say, well, it's an apartheid state. We boycotted South Africa during apartheid. Why well, can't buy Israeli tomatoes or Israeli uh, 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 pr produce and, and products and so on? Uh, so there is a connection between the academic, cultural, and the economic. Obviously, we cannot expect that BDS will uh, uh, massively impact Israel's economy. Neither, by the way, had the South African boycott massively undermined the South African economy. South Africa was still a strong economy at the end of apartheid. But the, the forms of resistance they chose in South Africa and the forms of resistance we're choosing in the Palestinian BDS movement impacted the state, the system of apartheid, uh, settler colonialism enough that it it revealed its true face to the world and affected public opinion against it. This affects members of parliament, this affects political parties, this affects decision making, uh, and not just uh, very famous artists, writers, filmmakers, uh, uh, and musicians, and so on. It affects policymakers ultimately. So B and D leads to S. With a lot of boycotts and divestment at the grassroots and civil society and institution level, the aim is to affect policymakers, to impose sanctions. Uh, we are pushing for legal targeted sanctions across the world. In the global south, the response has been amazing so far, with many former heads of state, hundreds and hundreds of MPs supporting this demand. So that would have a lot uh, of impact. But just you, you also asked a, a, a secondary question, which is, what are the indicators of impact? That's a very complex question, actually. But one very good indicator is how your enemy reacts. Uh, uh, if they're really ignoring you, you're not doing well enough. But Israel is anything but ignoring us. It, it has, for years, dedicated, until very recently, actually, a full government ministry, the Minister of Strategic Affairs, for fighting BDS. So we have, or proudly have, a full Israeli ministry fighting us until very recently, it was disbanded because it was a total flop, a complete disaster, a failure that siphoned tens and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, showing absolutely nothing for it. BDS kept growing and growing and growing. And today in the US Congress, BDS is discussed and no one asks, what is this BDS acronym? Everyone in Congress knows what BDS is because now you have members of Congress supporting BDS and, and, and calling for disbanding Israeli apartheid. In the US Congress, in the belly of the beast, that is one example of the impact. Another very quick one is major pension funds around the world divesting from companies involved in the occupation and settlements in apartheid, including the world's largest sovereign fund, the Norwegian Oil Fund. Uh, uh, the United Methodist Church in the US divested from major Israeli banks because they finance settlements in their illegal settlements in the occupied territories. So there are many, many examples of even economic impact that will need more time to, to be revealed. But certainly, all these factors uh, uh, interact with each other. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> just to pick up on uh, your last point, uh, it seems to me that we, we hear a lot more about 
the uh, cultural boycott than we do about the actual economic effects in Israel. Now, that's not to say that the cultural uh, boycott isn't uh, very important um, on Israel's reputation or reputational costs, but also, I mean, I'm thinking about the South Africa case, um, you know, anecdotally, uh, when I talk to people from South Africa, white South Africans, they will always say to me that the, the effect was more on morale. It was more about the culture, the sports boycott had much more impact, you know, not being able to participate in rugby or cricket or not to have, you know, concerts, rock musicians coming and, and so on and so forth, that this had a huge impact uh, on them. It was an impact on their morale. Uh, and I just wonder, you know, where we, the, that this is this is the aspect of the the tripartite levers that we hear most about in the case of Israel too. We don't hear so much about boycotting. I don't know Israeli produce, though that, as you say, might be a hidden factor because people might participate in uh, you know an everyday boycott of Israeli produce. Yes. And and uh, but I mean there must be ways of measuring that too. You know. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, a second. Uh, question for you is to do with uh, the nature of BDS itself, because you've, pre you've pr presented it to us as a kind of um, moral shift in the Palestinian struggle, um, also uh, that it's uh, imposing on outsiders a moral um, sort of conundrum and a moral obligation to take a position. And um, I just wonder uh, if you could reflect upon the relationship to uh, the history of Palestinian armed struggle. I mean, I, you could say, to take a critical position, you could say um, BDS is a reflection of a failure. It's a tactical shift. It's a, reflect a reflection of uh, a failure of the armed struggle. And uh, so, you know, you, force of arms isn't going to uh, achieve much, wasn't achieving much. Therefore, the struggle has to shift into some other dimension. And BDS is a response to that. Um, I mean, you know, what is the relationship to mm, the, the history of armed struggle? And of course, it's ongoing too. Uh, uh, I mean, Hamas' position is 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 very much, you know, following that Palestinian tradition of of armed struggle. So, how do you how do you see these two things uh, uh, well, matching up? Is it a complete rejection of 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 armed struggle was a failure? Therefore, we need to move it onto a different plane, or is it something more no, complex uh, at work? It's it's more complex. BDS did not evolve from that kind of mindset. Uh, um, many may not know, but BDS is rooted in a much, much longer heritage of resistance in Palestine than, than, than armed resistance. Boycotts go way back during the British mandate of Palestine, British colonial rule in Palestine, and then Zionist settler colonial uh, uh, influx. Throughout, boycotts have, were used by Palestinians as a form of nonviolent resistance. And there are many other forms of, of popular Palestinian resistance. So that's the real home of BDS, if you will. Those are the real roots of BDS. It's a very indigenous uh, movement. It's definitely inspired by South Africa, by the US civil rights movement, but it's a very indigenous Palestinian movement that we have a very long history of nonviolent resistance. The key point, Jim, is that what's new about BDS? It's not just unifying all Palestinians, regardless what form of resistance they support, they all understand that the, the armed resistance is never a popular resistance in the sense that everyone can join it. It's, it's a, in that sense, it's a tiny minority type of resistance, tiny, tiny minority. The absolute majority of Palestinians have always engaged in nonviolent popular resistance. Uh, poets and writers and students and academics and, and feminists and, and women and young people and youth and children have always participated in their own very creative forms of nonviolent popular resistance. Uh, um, so BDS comes from that rich heritage 
of Palestinian yeah. popular It's a good resistance. way of thinking about it. It's a kind of scaling up of what was a local to a more global. Absolutely. That, that, is it. that is exactly the point. It's a globalized intifada, so to speak. Because that's the lesson we learned from the first Palestinian uprising, the first intifada, 1987 to 1993. It was heroic. Yet, we couldn't achieve much due to many factors. But one of them is it did not, it wasn't met with meaningful solidarity internationally, globally. Solidarity was restricted to demonstrations and letter writing and emotional outbursts on the streets. It did not translate into cutting links of complicity. We do not want academics in the UK to demonstrate on the streets only and say down with apartheid. We want them to cut links of complicity, of LSE, of King's, of Oxford, of Cambridge, of every single university in the UK to divest from companies in, that are enabling Israeli apartheid and to end the links, research links, institutional links with Israel's complicity universities. That is the duty. That's the, the, the powerful part of BDS. It tells the world, if you're complicit, you have a profound moral obligation to act. Okay, Omar. Um, I have another question, but I'll, I'll keep it uh, for later. Um, we have uh, uh, some questions from the, the, the audience, and I'll put the first one to you. It comes from Professor John Childcraft, who you know. Uh, and he says, Omar, terrific to see you and hear your inspiring words. Welcome to LSE. Um, the message against complicity is well taken. Could you say a bit more about how the links with the movement for Black Lives are built and the key ways in which the movements are aligned transnationally? Uh, thanks for this, uh, John. Uh, yes, uh, this relationship between the struggles uh, for justice for Black people, especially in the United States, but not just in the United States, and Palestinian liberation go way back, as Angela Davis uh, never tires from reminding us. Uh, even in the 60s, there were already budding relations between Black liberation movements in the US and the Palestinian liberation movement. Uh, leaders such as Angela Davis, Malcolm X, and others saw this organic connection between those struggles, not just from the sense that justice is indivisible, which it is, but also connecting domestic oppression, domestic structures of racism in the US with the US imperialist role. Uh, uh, people like Malcolm X were among the first to explore that. The US empire is oppressing people of color globally and oppressing people of color domestically. And those two oppressions are very connected. It's the same a, a, a savage capitalist system, militarized system that is doing the oppression here and there. It's the same banking system, a security military establishment and so on that's, make, that's doing this oppression here and there. So they, they saw the connection, but the connection goes deeper actually, even today. Israel plays a key role in joint training sessions with, Israel, with United States police forces, security forces. They have massive programs of joint training where they share the worst examples of repression against activists, against uh, dissenters, uh, and so on. This militarization of police forces, whether in Israel or the US, against people of color, against brown people, black people, and so on, is very connected in, in a much deeper way than many uh, uh, can, can think. Uh, so, yes, the oppression is quite common. The U.S., after all, is the main enabler, funder of Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. So there's a huge responsibility there. And many people understand that the $3.8 billion that the U.S. gives to Israel in military funding annually comes at the expense of domestic needs. And it's not just the $3.8 billion. It's this militarized system comes at the expense of domestic needs, especially during COVID-19 with health, education, sustainable, decent jobs, and so on. So the connections go very deeply, not just at the level of uh, uh, leaders of the struggle were connected, uh, uh, saw their liberation struggles as connected, but also in seeing oppression as quite intersectional, and therefore resistance has to be intersectional as well. Uh, Umar, another question is, is concerns the, mm -hmm. um, the Human Rights Watch report. 
from April. And the extent to which that is that marks some kind of you know tipping point or um, you know some kind of watershed in terms of moment, momentum for BDS. Uh, what are what are your views on that? It is absolutely a tipping point. Absolutely. Uh, many of us have been uh, analyzing Israel as an apartheid system, not just a settler colony, not just a military occupation, but an apartheid system for many, many, many years, Some, in some cases, decades. Uh, uh, um, when B'Tselem, before Human Rights Watch, Israel's most prominent human rights organization, earlier this year reached the same conclusion, that Israel is indeed an apartheid system from the river to the sea. It's one Jewish supremacist apartheid system. That's what Bezalem said. It shocked a lot of the world. And then weeks later, a couple of months later, Human Rights Watch comes out and it's the biggest human rights organization in the world. So definitely that shows a tipping point that was reached. Today, Israel's lobby can no longer hide this blaring fact that Israel is seen globally as an apartheid state. It's not yet treated as an apartheid state. We're pushing, we're doing a lot of lobbying to push at the United Nations for recognition of Israel's system as an apartheid system and to push for sanctions, legal uh, 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 targeted sanctions against it. it. There's a lot of support for this idea. It's still very muted, but it's increasing radically especially after Israel's latest massacre uh, in Gaza. So yes, the Human Rights Watch report is a, absolutely a tipping point, and it's an extremely important report uh, 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 that shows what we've been saying for many, many years. <clears throat> yes, we have uh, another question. Uh, someone uh, supporting the idea of an academic bar boycott and um, uh, the question is, Arab states like the UAE and Saudi Arabia seem to be increasingly willing to collaborate with Israel economically, of course. Uh, uh, do you think the boycotting efforts of BDS can be effective without regional support for Palestine from other Arab states in the Middle East? It's important to distinguish, it's an important question. It's important to distinguish between regional support as in grassroots, civil society support and state support. These are two different things. Uh, uh, so let's not mix them. In those countries, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, uh, Morocco and others that have established diplomatic relations with Israel. And in the case of the UAE, it's establishing a security military alliance with Israel. Those dictatorships in the Arab world are unelected. They lack any democratic legitimacy. So to them, Israel's input in terms of military, security, uh, spyware, uh, Pegasus, uh, all tools of repression that they're buying from Israel, billions and billions of dollars, will increase the repression of human rights activists, uh, feminists, and, and not to mention UAE crimes in Yemen, for example, and so on and so forth, not to mention migrant workers and how they're treated uh, as modern slaves in the UAE. So yes, those dictatorships are increasingly relying on Israeli technologies of repression uh, uh, for their own domestic uh, needs. But that doesn't reflect regional support or lack thereof of support. We have massive support among Arab peoples, not Arab states. Uh, uh, and that's a key distinction. Can BDS work without the support of key Arab states? Of course, it is working. It's not a hypothetical question. It is growing tremendously around the world. And Israel acknowledges that it's growing tremendously and that Israeli efforts and lobby efforts have largely failed. This is in leaked documents that everyone has seen by today, that Israel recognizes that it's all its efforts, legal warfare, espionage, intelligence warfare, media propaganda have not succeeded in stopping or even slowing BDS. Omar, going back to the Human Rights Watch report, which said that Israel had met, had crossed this legal, the, the legal threshold uh, to meet the criteria for, for, for uh, being apartheid, an apartheid state. 
Uh, I wonder, could you comment on, on uh, give us your thoughts about this? Because, um, you know, the legal definition in the convention, you know, going, which I think it's 1973, doesn't, it's, it's very vague, like all of these international conventions. Um, it's, it's pretty vague. I mean, ultimately, this is going to be a political determination, and it seems very unlikely. Well, of course, one can never say never in international politics. Um, and one should always think the unthinkable. But it seems uh, currently very unlikely the U.S. would ever allow any kind of U.N. Um, sanctions-based approach to Israel, at least currently. And it's hard to envisage that changing in the uh, near term. But I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on this, the, the legal mm, criteria, you know, inhuman acts, um, uh, racially motivated. You know, so I'm just thinking if, if I wanted to be critical about the, the BDS position that Israel is an apartheid state, I would say, well, OK, apartheid is at the far end of the spectrum. You know, it's uh, so how, how well does Israel match up to that? And I think there would be, you know, incredible, uh, an incredible consensus that Israel is a very discriminatory state against its Palestinian, uh, both the Palestinian citizens of Israel and the, the, the population in the occupied territories. And that it would be, you know, very far along that spectrum. But would it meet the definition? Is it like South Africa and apartheid? you know, where there are all of these laws that are racially based. I mean, Israeli laws might be discriminatory in their practice, but in their formulation, all, not, not always, of course, but all, generally are not racially formulated. Military, actually, of course, that, military regulations actually, might be. Actually, that's false, uh, Jim. Okay. Um, Israel has more than 65 racist laws on the books. Uh, um as Desmond Tutu, uh, uh, Ronnie Castro's, and, man, um, and many, many, many leaders of the South African anti-apartheid movement have said, Israel is a worse apartheid than whatever we had in South Africa. And they should know. Archbishop Desmond Tutu should know. So when he visited the West Bank, he said, this is a worse form of apartheid. Uh, uh, Ronnie Castro's has said it a lot. Why is that? First, the legal aspect. Of course, Israel meets the definition of apartheid. It, it always has from day one. Since Israel was created, it, was, it has always been an apartheid state. It's just the lack of courage by human rights organizations and legal experts is what prevented it from being recognized as such until today. It's just a lack of, of, of courage. It's not a la lack of legal analysis. The legal analysis have been there for many, many years. Of course, it meets the definition of apartheid as a system of racial domination intended in, in, in a legalized manner, not just policy, but by law, denying people basic human rights on a discriminatory basis. So it's not a discriminatory system. It's a legalized domination, racial domination system. And that crosses the threshold, as Human Rights Watch says, to apartheid. In other words, the US is racist. So is the UK, so is France, definitely, and Germany, and others. They have many, many racist policies, obviously. But do they have racist laws? Do you have a law in the UK that says, unless you're white and Protestant, you're not entitled to the full set of rights? Uh, uh, as far as I know, they don't. But Israel does. Israel does have more than 60 such racist laws. Unless you're Jewish, you're not entitled to basic rights in Israel. The Israeli constitution, Israel doesn't have a constitution, has basic laws with constitutional power. Israel's basic laws do not have the E word for equality. They don't recognize equal citizenship. If you're a citizen of Israel and not Jewish, you're not equal to a Jewish citizen of Israel. Israel defines itself as a state of the Jewish people and them alone. It's not a state of its citizens. So any state that is by definition uh, founded on the premise that you have to be of a certain uh, ethnic religious type to qualify to be a full citizen and enjoy the full rights, that is definitely an apartheid state. Uh, 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 so it's, it's politically and legally, Israel has always been not just a settler colony, but an apartheid state. 
So if you think it has always been, then what what has changed recently, which would allow the uh, human rights organizations to, you know, be less fearful or as one as one Palestinian commentator put it, it's them that have crossed the threshold, not Israel. Israel, <laughs> Israel was always there. <laughs> it's human rights organizations that have yeah. crossed the threshold. Okay, but what has made them cross the threshold? Um, I'm not an expert on that. I, I would uh, prefer not to analyze that, but I think uh, BDS has certainly played the role. We've been arguing that Israel is an apartheid state. Israeli Apartheid Week is a major BDS event that happens annually on, on hundreds and hundreds of campuses worldwide. So the apartheid analysis has become much more acceptable, debatable uh, in the mainstream. Uh, artists talking about it, uh, writers, filmmakers, uh, very important Jewish intellectuals coming out and saying Israel is an apartheid, Israeli leaders. Israeli Zionist leaders saying, unless we do this, we will end up becoming an apartheid. So people lose the nuance of becoming an apartheid. They say, Israel, apartheid, Olmert and Barak and key Israeli Zionist leaders, you know, anti-Arab racist, but, but, but seeing the truth, mentioning apartheid, it became much more mainstream. Uh, debatable, but mainstream. So I think human rights organizations found that it's, it's become less politically suicidal to do so. Well, I think that's generally the case, even in academic circles, since we're talking, since your talk was mainly about uh, academics in prison. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, it, it was very difficult to use a term like apartheid in re relation to Israel without, you know, being attacked and vilified. And now it's, as you say, it's become much more part of the mainstream discussion. People might disagree yeah, about it, but it's part of the discussion. And just yesterday, Jim, the former deputy attorney general of Israel, the title of her article in Haaretz is, let's admit it, Israel is an apartheid system. Yeah. This is a former deputy attorney general, <laughs> yeah. not a leftist dissenting pro-Palestinian activist. This is a person yeah. of the establishment. I mean, the, the divisions within the Israeli elite also are, are, are something worth uh, reflecting upon. I mean, you had the two former ambassadors to South Africa who Absolutely. also wrote about it uh, not yes. so, no, over the summer. Uh, we have another question. Um, uh, it comes from one of our MSc Conflict Studies students. How much success has there been for the BDS movement uh, amongst African states? Uh, sorry. Uh, so she's uh, he or she is talking about changes in the uh, the uh, governing elites in African states, the generation of revolutionary leaders, and politicized civilian governments are kind of dying off. And there seems to be a generational shift where there's more normalization in relations with Israel among some South Af um, some African states. And um, uh, how can BDS reinvigorate more tangible African support for Palestine? A very timely question. In fact, in the last number of months, we've been working with partners across the African continent in establishing, and we have established it, um, the Pan-African Palestine Solidarity Network. It spans many African states uh, where there's uh, traditional and new solidarity movements. But the analysis of the questioner is absolutely correct. Uh, the former revolutionary parties becoming governments, that is uh, a phenomenon that is dwindling, it's true. But it's not a generational issue as much as uh, it is seeing the intersectional connection between the struggle for Palestinian liberation and ongoing struggles in Africa to, to finish the business of decolonization. Many young activists in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, and even the North of Africa, understand that colonization, decolonization is not over. It's not just saying that those damn British and French uh, uh, military forces de depart. That's not the end of colonialism. 
Yeah, colonialism goes out the door, comes through the window with corporations and banks and, and, and the militaries as well. Look at the French in Mali and so on. So they understand that decolonization with puppet regimes and dictatorships and authoritarian regimes continues. And therefore, uh, there will be no sustainable development, real justice, real economic justice, uh, uh, social justice, and so on, without decolonizing. And they see Israel's role in the continent. This, you, you'll see this in many, many, many analyses. It's not just about the Palestinians. Israel's role in the African continent has been horrific, not just being the biggest partner of apartheid in South Africa, providing it with nuclear capability, undermining the international boycott and so on. Israel was South African apartheid best friend, uh, 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 ideological buddies and so on. Israel's military uh, intervention and, and doctrines and weapons and uh, training is all over the African states, supporting the most the, the brutal dictatorships and civil wars. In Rwanda, Israeli weapons and training played a key role uh, uh, in, in the genocide. Uh, in South Sudan, in several African states, uh, the, the pillage of South African wealth, it's not just American and European uh, diamond companies and gold companies, it's also Israeli companies are part of this pillage system uh, of uh, African uh, wealth. So African activists in many states, and you cannot generalize, but in many states, we're seeing a lot of younger solidarity groups, progressive youth, feminists, uh, queer, uh, artists, academics, uh, workers, trade unions, joining the solidarity movement with Palestine because they see the connections. I think we're moving to a conclusion, uh, Omar. We've no more questions from the audience, so maybe I will um, <clears throat> conclude by asking you to look into your crystal ball and <laughs> uh, imagine where, where BDS is headed over the next five to 10 years. I mean, if we think of the South African analogy, things turned very quickly in South Africa uh, from the 80, mid 80s, let's say, uh, when President Reagan, Prime Minister Thatcher, very strong supporters of South Africa, the regime would not, you would not have imagined that the regime was on the verge of collapse in, say, 1985, and yet it was gone by 1995. So, um, you know, what, how do you see things looking ahead for BDS, for Israel, for Palestinians? It is very hard to tell. We might be good activists, but we're not good prophets. We cannot uh, predict the future very well. Uh, but we can definitely assess the direction of movement. And the direction of movement is more exposure of Israeli apartheid, uh, more gradual targeted sanctions, more struggles to end complicity, institutional complicity, individual complicity in Israel's system of oppression. We're seeing a lot more of that. I mean, just since May, since this May till now, this period of five months, we've never seen anything like this in the past two decades. This massive eruption of solidarity is truly unprecedented. Who would have imagined? Uh, but, but it's happening. Uh, um, so it's very hard to predict, but I think the direction of movement for the BDS uh, movement is, is going up, increasing its impact, increasing its influence, and Israel being much more exposed as part of this ultra-right, uh, uh, racist, xenophobic wave of authoritarianism and, 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 uh, 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 and fundamentalism and so on around the world. Omar Barghouti, thank you very much for your talk this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me.